1 through 6. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. For you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Verses 9 to 11. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is not a small thing that we celebrate this week. Not a, um, not a holdover, not something to perhaps just make our days better. But in fact, the gift of your Son, the gift of life itself, the gift of you, yourself to us, Lord. We ask at this time that you would be with those who are especially suffering, who are going through hardships of health or of financial or family problems. Lord, we are always beset by the things of this life that are very difficult, that present us times of worry, of concern, of sorrow. Um, at this time, Lord, we especially ask that um, those things would be uh, cared for by you, that they would be kept um, from, from keeping us from coming to you and s truly celebrating Christmas, Lord, truly celebrating Jesus. That you have sent your son, the light of the world, into a place of darkness to shine bright. Lord, I just pray that at this time, at this season, that not only would we be those who see the light of the life in the face of Jesus, but also be able to communicate that to others who so desperately need hope, who need to know that they're loved, who need a Savior. And this morning amidst wonderful welcomes from family that are at home, from singing songs of praise, of, of, of Christian Christmas worship, Lord. Uh, we were reminded that um, of all the things that we see in the world of what represent Christmas, truly it is only one thing, yes, really one person, that's Jesus. So we ask that as we look at your word this morning, that our hearts would be focused on him and that your word would, would take deep root in our hearts. That it would not just be a Christmas thing, but it would be um, for us each day moving forward to just celebrate uh, your love for us in the face of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to uh, 
I continue on the third of four Advent messages, unto us a, uh, unto us is born, and we're asking the question: Who is this person that was born to the world unto us? Jesus. What is it that the Gospels say about Jesus that we should take note? That uh, things that were really important to the Gospel writers, and and I feel that uh, you know this week. Uh, many churches, this is the, the Christmas celebration. I suppose it is for us because it, it really sounded like it. Um, and we sing a lot of songs and we um, have just wonderful greetings from the barons who, uh, as you know, haven't been able to be with us for, for a while. Um, and so I, I think it's so great to, to you know, remember that family isn't just who's sitting here today we have so many others and and indeed as we think of our friends and, and our extended families um, you know so many thoughts that come at Christmas time right when maybe in you know in April you're thinking about other things but but now you're we're thinking of family and family is very important um, one of the things that is important about God is he is all about family I don't know if that ever occurred to you, but just the fact that one of the things we call him is Father. Um, but also that the fact that what is uh, true about family, and even in this time when, you know, let's face it, some families just don't work real well together. <laughs> uh, there's always some problems with things, but they're still family, right? We're still family. And and the nature of the family is that there's always a connection. There's always um, a place for you with your family. It might be in the garage, but there's a place for you with your family. There's always a place. Sometimes we forget that when we think about theology. It's very religious and very sometimes impersonal. It's very difficult to communicate a gospel that sounds impersonal to a world that doesn't know him. So we have the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're at Luke this morning. And, and Luke is a very interesting gospel writer. Uh, he tends to be very precise about details. Um, he tends to tell stories about that are more social in nature. Uh, he tends to elevate the poor and, and, and women who are not regarded as, as equal to men at the time. And, and, and just the, the people that you would least expect to be counted by God as being somebody. Luke spends a lot of time on those people. The other thing that's interesting to me about Luke, since you asked, was that Luke is... is uh, from all accounts, not Jewish. He was a, a traveling partner, of course, of Paul uh, and Paul's missionary journeys for part of them. Um, but he writes his gospel as though he has done some extensive research on Jewish tradition and promise and understanding. Um, and a lot of it comes out not when you read it at first, but when you really think about it, it's like, wow, uh, funny that Luke should say that. So that we're going to, as we have in the past two weeks, talk about two words or phrases that the gospel writers bring out the early, you know, early in their gospels to describe Jesus, who this Jesus is that has come. And the first one is going to occur um, in chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 26 of chapter 1. of the Gospel of Luke, which reads, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to be concerned what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So the first thing we want, I want to point out this morning is the first phrase. And these are both kind of slashes. So the first one is, uh, the title is Son of the Most High. Okay. But the slash meaning of it, or the description of the Son of the Most High is great. Now you'll notice in both of these accounts that we'll read this morning, they're going to be angel announcements. Now, angel announcements, you know, don't come all that often. You know, certainly in the holidays that we celebrate, I believe, unless I'm corrected, that there's only two holidays that we separate that were announced by angels. One is Christmas. The other one is Easter or Resurrection Sunday, which was announced with the angels to the disciples. Uh, why are you looking for him amongst the dead? <laughs> he has, he's risen. So that's the only two occasions. We, none of the others, you know, Fourth of July. No, there's, you know, with all the bombs bursting in air, you know, angels aren't going to show up for that. And you know, this is these are the only two holidays that are declared from heaven. So as we look at this and, and see that the, the angels are talking to Mary and they're describing Jesus, right? He, he will be called uh, the Son of the Most High. But we read in, in verse 32 uh, the description of what that kind of means. What does that mean, the Son of the Most High? It means he will be great. I mean, it's almost like Luke was, was trying to think as we read this, because we use that saying all the time, right? It'll be great, you know? We're going to go out caroling. That'll be great, you know? Um, he will be great. It's like, I uh, can't think of any other words. He'll be great. But this is a very specific meaning uh, in this word, uh, great. I, I like the Greek word for this. It's megas. You know, he'll be mega. Yeah. It, it sounds great, you know? He'll be megas. Um, if you listen a little bit to, to what Luke is saying, he'll be great, he'll be the son of the Most High, he will have the throne of his father David, which means he will be eternal Messiah, Christ, King. Of, he will reign over the whole house of Jacob forever. His kingdom, there will be no end. The child to be born in verse 35, just a few sentences down. The, he will be called holy, the son of God. You know, these great things um, is what great means. Great, great. And it not meaning like Jesus will be a person who will have certain attributes that will be better. Like he'll, he'll you know, be the valedictorian of his school. You know, he'll be able to dunk from half court. You know, he's not great in the way that men measure greatness. Right. This instead refers more to a place of authority or place of entitlement. It's an entitlement, not like a description of it. Although I believe he's great characteristically, has great traits, but this is more about how he will be regarded in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is what's important. This is, this is the truth that we, we have to kind of grasp on here. Is that um, when Luke is talking, he's always operating from the base. And, and thus, we in Christianity are. Is this very basic understanding. That we need to recognize the exalted nature of God. That sounds pretty basic, right? We need to remember the exalted nature of God. That God is God. We are not God. That he is high and above all things. He is creator. He is judge. He is father. He is everything. We are creatures. We are created. 
Now, many times we have this idea about, uh, and I mean we, maybe we here, but certainly in the world, this idea of, well, how do you come to God? How do you reach God? How do you, well, you know, be a good person, then he'll see you're a good person, he'll give you a gold star like you get in Sunday school, and you get enough of those, and you'll get to be with him forever. Or that you can elevate yourself in such a way uh, as to place yourself in a place of favor with God. How do you reach God? This is the problem Israel is facing. Because they know they were the children of God, but now for centuries they've been without any kind of real visual of him actually working in their lives, right? Being, being under captivity by kingdom after kingdom after kingdom, and now in captivity in the Roman Empire. How do we get back to God? How do we reach God? That's a question today people ask. How do, how do we reach God? Because inside we know that we see ourselves and we say, you know, uh, I have some debits against my trying to get to God uh, and he must see those how can I reach him and the fact of the matter is that we are all in humanity born in a race uh, that is has declared itself pretty permanently against the kingship of God Paul writes for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God and, and really, in terms of modern vernacular, that's a ball game. There's no other, there's no after that. It, game's over, go home. Sorry, you lose. We need to understand that God is exalted. He is holy, he is righteous. And everything that is good and everything that is eternal and life has to come from there. And we need someone to, to go up and get that right, for us because we can't reach that. So when Luke writes, as he writes to, to a variety of people in the first century, and many of which we figure because of his writing and where it was circulated, that he's writing to depressed people. I mean, not like, oh, my life's terrible. But I mean, people in life that are just not, you know, the top tier of society. People who recognize that, you know, they said in the flyer, this life was going to be much better than it turned out to be. And how is it that we can start believing in a God when what we see in our lives around us seems so miserable? And that seems really kind of apt, too, for our times. That can lend itself to depression, for hopelessness, for despair, for solitary, right? For being alone. So what Luke writes is this. He says, there is someone that the angels announced to Mary. That she's going to give birth to someone and he will be great. That is great according to to uh, on on the scale he will be a man but he'll be a son of the most high he will have that in that none of us have do you see what i'm saying he will be the son of the most high first we have to understand god is the most high so he's there but there's one born who will be kind of in his court, in his family room, of his lineage, of his family, he will be son of the Most High, a place none of us have. And that's what he means, but he'll be great. He'll be great. And, and God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Why is this notion of great really important? I just want to show you something really um, interesting. Let's say. If you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, remember that the Jews were people who were supposed to be the children of God. Not the Gentiles. Not the people who weren't of Jewish lineage. Not the people who, 
you know, don't have riches, don't have religious acumen, uh, don't have uh, great temple attendance or whatnot, how are they going to benefit from this guy being the high son of God? Um, what is it that the Jews will hear when they hear, he will be great? In chapter 12 of Genesis, uh, God is speaking to Abraham at this time, Abram, right, before the whole name change thing. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to, a, to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. Now listen to this part. I will bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you I will curse. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you Abram. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that this promise that comes real early. From God to Abram to become Abraham. Is the idea that God will make his name great. And, and truly, uh, as we read in the Bible, what do the Jews refer to themselves? Well, we're the people who of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That even now, today, when you think of the lineage of Judaism, you think of Abraham. That they are people who belong to Abraham. And that what they had as a blessing as a nation as they grew as a people of God is that they, were, they came from him. They were part of his thing. Why? Because God made his name great. We come to Luke and, and Luke says he will be great. That is he will be a person not only a son of the Most High, but a person that when people are belonging to him, coming from him, a part of him, they will be blessed. The nation shall be blessed. And then you start seeing that what we read in Abraham just doesn't apply to the Jews. That he was a foreshadow of the one in whom the nations would truly be blessed. The Christ who came and died for all. The Son of God, the one who is great, who has the in with the Father, he's, that no one else is a means by which they can come to the Father. Only me, says Jesus. Only me. Why? Because I'm the only Son of the Most High. I'm the only one that has the in with the Father. So we find this really early in the, in the angel's announcement, right? And this, this is actually really bringing out some of the heavier theology of this passage. But this is what people will hear when they hear, He's Son of the Most High. He will be great. Do you understand, believer, that the person that you place your trust in is great? I don't, I don't mean great as the world reckons great. I mean great as though he is the son of the most high God. He is the one when you place a trust in and you belong to him that you have the father's mind and heart, if I can you know, anthropomorphize it. You have his ears. You have his love. You have him. He is the Son of the Most High. And he is such that he's not just a spiritual guy, but he is king. That is, it, even in this time, he is one who reigns, whose authority is absolute, whose power has no end, who cannot be overcome, who cannot be refuted. 
that what he wills for your life and his protection for you and his love for you and his guidance of you, his salvation of you is sure and cannot be thwarted by the evil one. That though this world may try to tear you down, you are always kept by the king whose throne is eternal and will never end. So that's the first part. We could stop there and say amen. amen. <laughs> amen. Um, but I promised you to. The second one comes in the, in the very famous passage in chapter 2 of the birth of Jesus. And I'm going to read the section of the angel's announcement since I made such a big stink about it earlier. So um, the shepherds are out there in the... In, in the field, keeping their flock by night, which I always found very interesting, right? Um, it's a night job. They didn't have the great shift. They get the graveyard shift, right? And it's like, oh. um, one of the places where you would least expect angels to show up, right? You expect them to show up in the city square, you know. Mary is understandable, you know. The one who will give birth to the Christ, shepherds. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were feared, uh, filled with fear. Uh, I'll tell you the story. I'm sorry. I haven't told you a story yet today. Um, I was in church when I was a little kid. I was in church in LA, and we, we had a Sunday evening church, and it was kind of Christmas time. And um, some of the young kids and my cousins were part of that. My cousin was up there, and he was reading this part, and, and I think in the King James it says, "And the and they were sore afraid." Right? You heard that? And and the pastor stopped uh, my cousin. My cousin six years old he stopped my cousin and, and said what does that mean um, that they were sore afraid and my cousin stopped and thought and he said it means they were so afraid that it hurt <laughs> so afraid that it hurt now that's funny but I think that's super accurate <laughs> they're so afraid it hurt um, so I just want to say that to build this picture <laughs> um, the glory of the Lord shone about them they were filled with fear so that it hurt and the angels said to them fear not <laughs> for behold I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ to the Lord and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. You think they were afraid before. <laughs> there was a heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So the second word uh, I want us to get is Savior, which is also Christ, Savior. And the slash of this is peace. Savior, peace. Just as the Son of the Most High meant great, Savior means peace. Not, not peace when you have like a warm comforter on and, you know, nice little back massager. Although that's nice. But this is specifically peace with God. Because anytime the angels show up to a nation that has been oppressed for centuries and really has seen no sign that God is really showing them any favors, like, oh, th this is going to be bad, right? <laughs> This is bad. Angels are showing up. It's the end. They're like, no, don't be afraid. 
This is good news. It's time to sing and shout. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior. And the angels respond in the chorus, glory to God in the highest, glory to that God most high that we mentioned, and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out. First is a technical note. A lot of times we've learned this, this verse as glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men, right? That's how we know. And the difference between that and what I just read is uh, just a sigma, little s, that shows in Greek on some manuscripts and does not on other manuscripts. So the oldest, I'm just making this real short, the oldest, more reliable manuscripts show it in what's called the genitive case, which means with whom he is pleased. So I'm going to read you what a very smart Greek guy writes. The meaning seems to be not that divine peace can be bestowed only where human goodwill is present, or already present, but that at the birth of the Savior, God's peace rests on those whom he has chosen in accord with his good pleasure. Okay? So, let's clear that up. Because this has everything to do with God's pleasure. Okay? Um, we talked about it a little bit last week. It's the same idea. The idea that God wants to do something. It is his pleasure, and by pleasure, not just joyful act of doing it, but it's his choice. It is his design. It is his will to do this. The second thing I want to point out, too, is this idea of peace. Um, peace is very important in the Jewish life, lifestyle and their tradition. You know, it's their, what? You know the word, right? It's their shalom. It is their indication, the word, that between us and God, we're good. Shalom. And I want to point you to a verse that you know, that we studied, that you memorized when we did the book of Numbers, right? And like, oh, I missed that, that quiz. Number six, what is the blessing that we read in, in number six? The Lord bless you and keep you. This is spoken by Moses. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons, and you shall thus bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance, his face, upon you and give you peace. And then verse 27 is key here. So shall they, the priests, put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. That's what this passage in, Numbers, in Luke 2 is about. The angels announcing that this baby Jesus is the face of God. He's lifting his countenance to his people to give them peace so that as this little baby Savior Christ is born, who will be the high priest of God, who will bring peace, he will stamp on the people who come in faith as the very people of God to receive peace, to receive blessing. That this is God's ultimate fulfillment of Numbers chapter 6. And those of Jewish tradition may catch this. They might say, oh, this peace thing. You mean like number 6 peace? Like... Because the angels, who are really in this way functioning as announcers of the priest, the high priest, Jesus, but they're functioning as the ones saying, look, 
This is the way that God is going to bring you in accordance to, with him, in line with him. So that this idea, okay, we can get Jesus as the Son of the Most High God, but I'm not Jesus. I don't have that. They're saying, because God has sent his Son to you, when you are with him, you got that. You got that. This phrase, do not overlook. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. That Jesus came to do his saving, his peacemaking on earth. It's happening on earth. We could not reach the heavens. Jesus came to do his work on earth. You know, it would have made sense to me if Jesus did his work in heaven, you know, and, and did what he needed to do in a safe, sterile environment <laughs> without taking the big risks of having to do it here because so much can go wrong here. Just look at all the things we try to get done. <laughs> You know, opposition from the Pharisees, you know, people wanting to make him king too early, you know. The whole having to grow up and live as a man in society, which you got to believe is just as or hard as it is today. But he came to do it on our turf, in a way, in our terms, having to pay the death that we said he had to pay, having to bear the sin that we did, that we called our own, and it was done here. So you put those things together, and I'll close with this. That the Son of the Most High, the one that has the highest rank, the highest everything, we read in Colossians, right? That, that everything that, that was done in creation was through him and for him, and that everything in God's plan, he is the first one, so that in all things he might be preeminent. He is great. He's the greatest. And he has this position. And what he did was he came as a baby on our land. In our times. In our uh, fragile state. Hardly great by our standards. And his life was lived in servitude. In grace, without plenty, and he died a death on a Roman cross. And all of this was done because the Father designed and was pleased to do this for his glory, but also for us. Of his great love for us. Because what he wanted between him and us is no more this gap. No more this, I can't reach you, God, there's no way. No more game over. Ben said, he said, I want peace. I want you to be with me here as family. As family. Not as tarnished family. Not sleeping out in the garage of heaven, but in the very courts of God with your Savior and Lord, the Great One, Jesus. That's what he gave us on Christmas Day. And as we see in Luke, why he writes this, because there's so many people that have no hope for a Great One in this life. We certainly don't deserve it. 
And we know it. And yet that's God's grace that he should give to us his son. God demonstrates his great love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is Christmas. This is the great gift that God has given us. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you have us remember these words of Luke, these descriptions that we read of the angel's proclamation, that they would hit us hard, that they would not just go away with the turning of this day into the next, but that you would... Uh, will for your word to impact our hearts, to know that we were loved, that we uh, were, um, that it, was, it pleased you to do this, to send your son, the son of the most high, the great one who has always been with you, to bring peace to us here so that we might have life with you there. I pray that those hearing this would have a renewed sense of your love for us, a renewed value and cherishing of Jesus this day, and that we would know that, that in faith we are never living a moment, never walking a step without your great love for us in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.